After the convention of Kuta Haya that ended the First Ottoman-Egyptian War, the Ottoman Empire ceded Syria to Muhammad Ali Pasha. After this concession, Muhammad Ali moved on to proclaim independence, which angered the sublime port, who called him a traitor. Eventually, the Ottoman Empire prepared an army to go and recapture Syria, which had been lost six years earlier. This action triggered the Second Ottoman-Egyptian War. The war is the climax of the long power struggle between the Ottoman Empire and the Pasha of Egypt, Muhammad Ali, which had reached a point of crisis that threatened to destabilize the whole of the Levant. On June 24, 1839, the Ottoman army, accompanied by the infamous Helmuth von Moltke the Elder, invaded Syria and reached Nezib, where they would encounter the opposing Egyptians. The two armies were well equipped and balanced. The number of soldiers in each army was approximately 40,000 men, supported by artillery and knights. Constantine Basili says, since he applied European tactics in the east, he has never met in the battlefield of AIVA better than these two armies. In terms of training the Egyptian army, he was trained in the latest military methods in terms of organizing ranks, speed of movement and maneuvering, the presence of Suleiman Pasha the French as chief of staff of the Egyptian army, and the leadership of Ibrahim Pasha, who became an expert on how to defeat the Ottoman armies years ago. On the other hand, the Ottoman army enjoyed the preference in terms of preparation, as the Ottoman army was better supplied and had rested for several weeks in its camp. Unlike the Egyptian soldiers who were exhausted by the march to meet the Ottoman army under the heat of the sun at the beginning of the summer, the two armies were close together. Hafez Pasha, the commander of the Ottoman army, spent an entire month digging trenches and establishing strongholds and fortresses, and his army was flexible to defend and attack in that region, and there was a difference between those who stood to defend and those assigned to attack, as the attack is undoubtedly more difficult. The Ottoman army was composed mainly of recently subdued Kurdish conscripts, and their morale was low. But Ibrahim Pasha's army was more complete and more combat-oriented. Ibrahim Pasha and his chief of staff, Suleiman Pasha Ali, had one opinion, while Hafez Pasha and his chief of staff Moltke had two different opinions. Ibrahim Pasha's officers respected and feared him, and all of them had earned their ranks from his wall and merit. As for the officers of the Turkish army, most of them were among the leaders of the rulers and ministers in Istanbul. One story narrates how Hafez Pasha, the commander of the Ottoman army, asked a prisoner from Ibrahim Pasha's army his opinion in the two camps. Then the Egyptian prisoner told him after half as Pasha gave him safety. Ibrahim Pasha's camp is a soldier's camp. As for your camp, it is like the pilgrim strikes. In Ibrahim's camp, you only see soldiers with their weapons, besides their horses and cannons. As for your camp, I saw the Jews, merchants, scholars, and jurists. Your camp is like pilgrimage rackets. Several hours prior to when the major combat began, von Moltke had pleaded half his Pasha to withdraw to a more secure and fortified position near Bayrasik and to await expected reinforcements, as half his Pasha's forces were outmatched in quality by the advancing Egyptians. Initially, half his acquiesced to Moltke, but not long after he decided to maintain his army's position, due to the advice of his mullahs. The Ottoman troops under Hafez Pasha were positioned at Mezar, southwest of Nezib, with the Nezib River on their left. Ibrahim advanced his force, under heavy Ottoman artillery fire, towards the Ottoman lines. At the same time, the Ottoman line began to take Egyptian artillery fire and was suffering losses. By the time Ibrahim's infantry had encountered the Ottoman line, Hafez's army was in complete rout, the Egyptian artillery having broken their morale. This threatened to place Constantinople itself and the rule of the entire eastern Mediterranean within his grasp. A few days after the battle, the Ottoman Sultan, Mahmud II, died, leaving his empire in the hands of his 16-year-old heir, Abdul Mesut. Meanwhile, the Ottoman fleet had defected to Muhammad Ali. Britain, Russia and Austria were all pledged to support the tottering Ottoman Empire and to force Muhammad Ali, who had the support of France and Spain, to withdraw from Syria. Although the new Sultan's ministers moved to resolve the crisis by offering to cede the rule of Syria to Muhammad Ali, the British, Austrian and Russian ambassadors forced them to rescind this offer and stand firm against him. 
there was even a possibility of war with France, who looked to Muhammad Ali's success to increase its sphere of influence in the Near East. In June 1840, Admiral Sir Robert Stopford, commanding the British Mediterranean fleet, sent Commodore Charles Napier with a small squadron to the Syrian now the Lebanese coast. He was then ordered to proceed to Beirut to compel the Egyptians to withdraw. The situation on the ground was extremely volatile and called for quick and decisive action. This Napier provided, acting as if his was an entirely independent command. On August 11, 1840, Napier's ships appeared off Beirut and he called upon Suleiman Pasha, Muhammad Ali's governor, to abandon the town and leave Syria, whose population shortly revolted against Muhammad Ali's occupying army. With such a small force, there was little that Napier could do against 15,000 Egyptian troops until September, when Stopford's ships joined up with him. Open war broke out on September 11th, when Napier bombarded Beirut and effected a landing at Juni with 1,500 Turks and Marines to operate against Ibrim, who was prevented by the revolt from doing more than trying to hold the coastal cities. Due to the illness of the Brigadier General of the Army, Sir Charles Smith, Napier was instructed to command the land force and made a successful sortie against a force of Albanians at Nari el Kelb. He then, with a mixed squadron of British, Turkish and Austrian ships, bombarded Sidon on September 26th and landed with the storming column. Sidon capitulated in two days. While preparing to attack the Egyptian positions on the heights of Bohas, Napier received an order to retire from the command of the land forces to make way for Brigadier General Smith, who had recovered from his illness, and also had received command of the Turkish force in the Allied army. To do this, Napier would need to retreat from his position. He decided to disobey the order and continued with the attack against Ibrahim's army. The fighting on October 9th was furious, but victory was secured. Napier then left the land forces to Smith. Meanwhile, the Egyptians had abandoned Beirut on October 3rd. The fleet was then instructed to retake Acre, which was the only coastal position left in Egyptian hands. The Mediterranean fleet, commanded by Stopford and supported by small Austrian and Turkish squadrons, moved into position against the western and southern sides of Acre on November 3rd to 4 and opened fire at 2 p.m. The ships anchored closer to the shore than expected, at 450 to 800 meters, and the Egyptian guns were aimed too high. The fire of the ships was devastatingly accurate thanks to the training associated with the Royal Navy's new gunnery school, HMS Excellent. The Egyptians had no opportunity to correct their error. Their guns were disabled by direct hits and by the walls of the fortifications falling on their crews. The sailing ships of the line were in two lines, with steamers maneuvering in between. At 4.20 p.m., a shell penetrated the main magazine in the south of the city, which exploded, killing 1,100 men. The guns ashore fell silent and that night the city was occupied. British losses were light, 18 men killed and 41 wounded. The ships had fired 48,000 rounds. The rapid collapse of Muhammad Ali's power, with the prospect of bloody chaos in Egypt, was not part of the Allies' plan, and Stopford sent Napier to command the squadron at Alexandria and to observe the situation. Here, acting independently again, he appeared before the city with part of his squadron on November 25th and enforced a blockade. Then, without reference to his admiral or the British government, he personally negotiated a peace with Muhammad Ali, guaranteeing him and his heirs the sovereignty of Egypt and pledging to evacuate Ibrahim's beleaguered army back to Alexandria if Muhammad Ali in turn renounced all claims to Syria, submitted to the Sultan and returned the Ottoman fleet. Stopford and the British ambassador were furious with this outcome. Stopford repudiated it immediately when he had heard the news and several of the Allied powers declared it void. Despite Napier's long-standing personal friendship with Lord Palmerston, the arrangement was at first announced by the British government, but the formal treaty later concluded and confirmed by the Sultan used Napier's original as the basis for negotiations and differed from it only in minor ways. Muhammad Ali was to withdraw immediately his forces from Syria, Arabia, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, Crete and the district of Adana, all within the Ottoman Empire. 